ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد Today then in the section regarding the sunnah we are on the fifth hadith mentioned by Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and that is fi ithbat ar-rijl aw al-qadm in the affirmation of the foot so here it mentions qawluhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam la tazalu jahannam yulqa fiha وهي تقول هل من مزيد حتى يضع رب العزة فيها رجله وفي رواية عليها قدمه فينزوي بعضها إلى بعض فتقول قط قط متفق عليه In this hadith it mentions that the people will continue to be thrown into the hellfire. The people are going to be continue to be thrown into the hellfire. And the hellfire will continue to say, Hal mim mazid? Are there any more? And so they are thrown in and the hellfire continues to say, هَلْ مِنْ مَزِيدٍ Are there any more? <coughs> Up until حَتَّى يَضَعَ رَبُّ الْعِزَّةِ فِيهَا رِجْلَهُ وَفِي رِوَايَةِ قَدَمَهُ Until Until Allah سبحانه وتعالى places his foot within that and then it collapses upon itself. It gathers together upon itself and then says, Qat, Qat, meaning sufficient, enough, enough. لا تزال جهنم يلقى فيها هذا يوم القيامة يعني يلقى فيها الناس والحجارة so on Yawm al the stones and people will be thrown into the hellfire as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Qur'an فَاتَّقُوا النَّارَ الَّتِي وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةِ So fear the fire whose fuel is men and stones Fear the fire, the fuel of which is men and stones. وَقَدْ يُقَالْ يُلْقَى فِيهَا النَّاسُ فَقَطْ وَأَنَّ الْحِجَارَ لَمْ تَزَلْ مَوْجُودَ فِيهَا وَالْعِلْمُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ And it could be the case that the stones... These stones that are mentioned as fuel of the fire, that they will already be placed in the fire. They will already all be in the fire. So that the only thing being added into the fire on Yawm al are the people themselves who are being thrown in. It could be in that way. It could be that the stones are already all in there and only the people are going to be thrown in. And as they are being thrown in, the fire is saying, Hal mim mazid? Are there more? And it could be that actually the stones as well as the people are all being thrown in. So yulqa fiha في هذا دليل على أن أهلها والعياذ بالله يلقون فيها إلقاء لا يدخلون مكرمين 
This also highlights to us in the narration where it says they will be thrown into the fire. That on that day, the people of the fire will be thrown into it. Meaning in that disgraced way, thrown in. Not that they will enter in on their feet and walking honored. They will not enter in an honorable way. They will be thrown in disgraced into that fire. فَلَا يَدْخُلُونَ مُكَرَّمِينَ They do not enter the fire with any nobility or honor. They enter in disgrace. بَلْ يَدْعُونَ أو يَدْعُونَ إِلَى النَّارِ جَهَنَّمَ دَعَى كُلَّمَا أُلْقِيَ فِيهَا فَوْجٌ سَأَلَهُمْ خَزَنَتُهَا أَلَمْ يَأْتِكُمْ نَذِيرٌ that every time a group of them are thrown in, the guardians of the fire, they say, Did a warner not come to you? Did a warner, Alam yatikum nadir? Did a warner not come to you? And so, as they are being thrown in on that day, the people are being cast into the fire on that day. Then it will say, Hal min mazid? Are there more? Hal min mazid? Hal lit talab? And the question here is a request. Hal min mazid? Are there more? As a request, meaning throw more in. Put more in as a request. Not just a question, are there any more? A request, are there more? Meaning put more in. It is a request being made. هَلْ لِلطَّلَبْ يَعْنِي زِيدُوا وَأَبْعِدُ النَّجْعَ نعم. But as for the, those who said... That the meaning of this question is that the fire is simply inquiring. That it is an istifham for a negation. Meaning, المعنى على زعمه لا مزيد على ما فيه والدليل على بطلان هذا التأويل There are some who say that when the fire says, are there more? That it is a negation, that there are no more. But the reality is against that meaning. The correct understanding of that is that it is a request from the fire. That give me more, put more in. And the meaning is not as some claimed that the fire is giving a statement of negation, that there are no more. That is far from the reality. The reality is, it is a request from the fire. Give more, are there more? Up until, حَتَّى يَضَعَ رَبُّ الْعِزَّةِ فِيهَا رِجْلَهُ وَفِي رِوَايَ عَلَيْهَا قَدَمَهُ Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places his foot upon it. لأن هذا يدل على أنها تطلب الزيادة. So this indicates the fire was requesting more to be thrown in. وإلا لما وضع الله عليه رجله حتى ينزوي بعضها إلى بعض، فكأنها تطلب بشوق إلى من يلقى فيها زيادة على ما فيها. So the fire up until that point. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts his foot upon it, up until that point the fire is requesting for more to be thrown in, requesting for more to be put in, until Allah places his foot upon it and it comes together from its, uh, uh, co- comes together after the foot of Allah is placed upon it. وَهُنَا نَعْمْ حَتَّى يَضَعَ رَبُّ الْعِزَّةِ عَبَّرَ بِرَبِّ الْعِزَّةِ لِأَنَّ الْمَقَامُ مَقَامُ عِزَّةِ وَغَلَبَةِ وَقَهْرَ In the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu mentioned until Rabbul Izzah places his foot upon it. 
didn't just say until Allah places his foot upon it, but rather Rabbul Izza. Because that time, that moment when that is occurring is a circumstance and a situation that is relevant to the Izza of Allah, to the might and power and majesty of Allah. And so that is the way that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam phrased it, Rabbul Izza, because Allah is the one who controls the affairs on that day, controls who is thrown into the fire and who is not. Allah is the one who is the king and the judge of that day. So the Rabb, بمعنى صاحب, وقوله فيها رجله وفي رواية عليها قدمه في وعلى معناهما واحد هنا These حروف الجر في and على in these contexts of the two riwayat they mean the same thing and that is completely normal because the حروف الجر in the Arabic language are interchangeable and that is known and mentioned in Al-Fiyat ibn Malik the huruf al-jar can take each other's meanings so in this in the two riwayat in the two versions of the narration one saying fi one saying ala both of them refer to the same thing here wal-zahir anna fi bima'na ala kaqaw na'am so here it would appear that the fi is taking the meaning of ala. So both of them mean ala until Allah puts his foot upon the fire. أَمَّا الرِّجْلِ وَالْقَدَمِ فَمَعْنَاهُمَا وَاحِدٍ وَسُمِّيَتْ رِجْلَ الْإِنسَانِ قَدَمًا So as for the two narrations, one mentioning a rijl and one mentioning al qadam. Once again, both of those are referring to the one and same thing. It is not two separate things being mentioned in the two narrations. They both mean the same thing again. And that is something recognized and known as well. That Ar-Rijal and Al-Qadam in the Arabic language can refer to the same thing, the same uh, meaning. فَسُمِّيَتْ رِجْلُ الْإِنسَانِ قَدَمًا لِأَنَّهَا تَتَقَدَّمُ فِي الْمَشِي And the reason why the leg of a person can be known as the foot, as we say in English, رِجْلُ الْقَدَمْ Both of those indicate the same because both of those are when you walk, they are at the front. When you're walking, it is your foot that goes forward first. And that's the word in Arabic, qadam, taqaddama, to go ahead, to go first. So your foot goes first when you're walking, hence it is given that name in the Arabic language. So then, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places his foot upon the fire. فَيَنْزَوِي بَعْضُهَا إِلَى بَعْضُ So it comes together, it is squashed together. From its sides, يعني ينضم بعضها إلى بعض من عظمة قدم الباري عز وجل. So when Allah places His foot upon the fire, then all of that it tumbles upon itself, it squashes in, its sides come together. فتقول قطي قطي. And so then the fire says, enough, enough. يعني حسبي حسبي That is sufficient, that is enough لا أريد أحدا يعني That I do not want any more Before the fire was saying Are there more? Give me more But then after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Places his foot upon the fire And it comes together and squashes together Then it says no more قط قط Enough, enough, sufficient, sufficient. So in this hadith, there are several benefits. <coughs> Firstly, as is the aqeedah of Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah, that the hellfire is already 
created and exists. The hellfire is already created and it exists. Also the narration highlights to us that the fire speaks, that the fire will speak, فِيهِ إِثْبَاتِ كَلَامْ النار وأنها تتكلم. It is an affirmation of the speech of the fire and that it speaks. وهل هذا الكلام بلسان المقال أم بلسان الحال؟ فيه قولان أصحهما الأول للحديث ولأن الأصل الحقيقة. So there's a difference between the scholars as to what that means exactly that the fire will speak. But the correct opinion appears to be the apparent that the fire will be given an ability to speak and so it will speak. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ سُبْحَانَهُ تَعَالَى يَخْلُقُ فِيهَا إِدْرَاكًا وَاللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will create for the fire an ability to to recognize what is occurring, to have some sense of the situation. And so it will say, are there more, are there more? And then when the foot of Allah is placed upon it, it will say, enough, enough. Allah is all capable of the affairs. And so the fire will be given some senses to perceive these affairs on that day. وفيه دلالة على عظم سعة النار وعمق قعرها بحيث تسع كل عاص لله من حين خلق الله الخلق وتطلب الزيادة. It also indicates the vast size of the hellfire. That all of the, the wrongdoers and the sinners, the mushrikun, all of those who are going to be entered into the fire from the beginning of creation, from the beginning of creation to the end, all of those who are going to be thrown into the fire, they are thrown in and they are thrown in and they are thrown in. And the fire is still saying, are there more, are there more? And this is not just if you even imagine the population of the earth right now. Seven billion, whatever they say. From those, they say on their figures, one billion are Muslim. Something along those lines. So if they say one billion are Muslim, for example, so even right now, there are six billion upon shirk and kufr. That's just right now as we speak. Then what therefore historically all the way from the beginning of creation. And all of them will be thrown into the fire. And yet it says are there more? Are there more? Give more. It indicates the vast size of the fire. And the depth of the fire. وَلَمَّا كَانَ مِنْ مُقْتَضَى رَحْمَتِهِ أَلَّا يُعَذِّبَ أَحَدًا بِغَيْرِ جُرْمٍ وَكَانَتِ النَّارِ فِي غَايَةِ الصِّعَةِ حَقَّقَ وَعْدَهُ فَيَضَعُ عَلَيْهَا قَدَمَهُ فَيَتَلَاقَى طَرَفُهَا وَلَا يَبْقَى فِيهَا فَضْلٍ عَنْ أَهْلِهَا بَرَفْكُ <تصفيق> Of course we know that by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is necessitated by the mercy of Allah is that he will not punish anyone who is not deserving of punishment. So when all of the people who deserve to be entered into the fire have been entered in, now if the fire says Hal min mazid, then there are no others to be thrown in. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not throw in more that did not deserve to be thrown in. 
unlike paradise, there are narrations that highlight when all of the people who deserve to go to paradise enter paradise, there is still space. And so Allah creates people on that day and enters them into paradise immediately. Whereas hellfire, nobody will be thrown into the hellfire who did not deserve it. So at that point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places his foot upon the fire. And so the edges, they collapse in onto themselves until there is no more space left within that fire. وَأَمَّا الْجَنَّةِ فَيَبْقَى فِيهَا فَضْلٌ عَنْ أَهْلِهَا فَيُنْشِئُ اللَّهُ لَهَا خَلْقًا آخَرِينَ كَمَا ثَبَتَ ذَلِكَ فِي الْحَدِيثِ So as for the paradise, when all of the people have gone in and there is still space, then Allah does create a creation then, creates them then, and enters them into paradise immediately. But with the hellfire, when there is space left, Allah does not enter anyone into it who did not deserve it. So Allah places his foot upon the fire until it collapses upon itself and there is no more space left within it. So with regards to this then, we say Al-Qadam wa Rijl fi al-Hadith min Sifatillah المنزه عن التكييف that we affirm <coughs> these attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without any takyif without any description meaning we do not try to imagine what the foot of Allah is we do not try to imagine or give descriptions to the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we affirm what Allah has affirmed for Himself. That was the principle at the beginning of Wasatiyah. Nasifullah bima wasafa bihi nafsa wa wasafahu bihi rasuluh. We will attribute to Allah whatever Allah has attributed to himself or what the messenger has attributed to him. So these are from the benefits that the inanimate objects, Allah will give an ability to speak, the hellfire will speak and also a warning from the hellfire. A warning to be precautious and to take care that you do not end up in that hellfire. Also within it is the great virtue of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will not put into the fire anyone who was not deserving of it. And the key here though is the affirmation of the attribute of the rijal and qadam to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in reality. حقيقيه ان لله تعالى رجلا وقدما حقيقيه لا تماثل ارجل المخلوقين that they are not in any way comparable or resemblant of the uh, attribute of the foot of anything in creation وخالف الأشاعرة وأهل التحريف في ذلك The people of innovation they once again opposed أهل السنة والجماعة and they misinterpreted what is being mentioned here فقالوا يضع عليها رجله they said that when the messenger mentioned that Allah will place his foot upon it, يعني طائفة من عباده مستحقين للدخول. 
والرجل تأتي بمعنى الطائفة كما في حديث أيوب عليه الصلاة والسلام أرسل الله إليه الرجل جراد من ذهب يعني طائفة من جراد The people of innovation said that the hadith here mentioning Allah places his foot upon the fire. That the rijl, rijlun, in Arabic can have the meaning of a group or amount of something. It is mentioned. It is mentioned. That it can have the meaning of a group or amount of something. So they say the meaning of the narration that Allah will put his rijal upon the fire is that he will put an amount or a group of people who were deserving of the fire into the fire and that when that final group of people are put into the fire it collapses upon itself and there's no more space left. So they say that's all it is. It's just the final large group of people who were deserving of the fire. That's the rijal. Because the word rijal can in some contexts be used to mean ta'ifa. Like a group or a selection of people or amount of something. But of course this is going back to the issue of the primary meanings and what you affirm of the attributes in their meanings, and then going off onto secondary and tertiary meanings without any evidence. So that's what they try to claim. And also, one of the reasons that cannot be correct is even in the Arabic language itself, because one of the wordings of the hadith, you remember, used the harf jarfi. That would work. Put the ta'ifa, the group of people, fi he or fiha in it. But then what are you going to do with the narration that says the rijal uh, went alayha? How was this final group of people put upon the fire? Rather than into the fire, we know that the people are placed into the fire, not somehow above, on top of, upon the fire. So the harf jar ala would negate this possibility of that meaning to the word rijal in this narration too. وَأَيْضًا لَا يُمْكِنْ أَنْ يُضِيفُ اللَّهُ أَنْ يُضِيفَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلَهَ لَلنَّارِ إِلَى نَفْسِهِ لِأَنَّ إِضَافَةَ شَيْءِ إِلَى اللَّهِ تَكْرِيمُ وَتَشْرِيفُ Also, it mentions here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not attribute the people of the fire to himself. لا يمكن أن يضيف الله عز وجل أهل النار إلى نفسه Meaning in the hadith it says that Allah places رجله وقدمه his foot. According to them it means he will place his final group of sinners into the fire. It would not be the case that Allah attributes those people, those evildoers deserving of the hellfire to himself with that pronoun. Rijlahu. In that meaning then, according to them, it's saying Allah will then place His final group of sinners into the fire. Directly attributing them to Himself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not directly attribute those wrongdoers and those sinners to Himself. Because what is attributed to Allah, they are always affairs of Nobility, what is attributed to Allah is always in a manner of nobility and honor. Rasulullah, Baytullah, what is attributed to Allah is always for nobility and honor. So how can it be that it is being mentioned of those wrongdoers and sinners and mushrikun and whoever they are? 
that group are being attributed to Allah. Allah will place his sinners and wrongdoers into the hellfire. Rijlahu. So Ahl Sunnah said, no, this cannot be. The attribution would not be in this way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So once again, this highlights the incorrect understanding of the people of innovation. It is not the group of sinners who are the rijlahu. Rather, it is upon reality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put his foot upon the fire and then it will say sufficient, enough, enough until then no more space remains within it. (coughs) We'll stop for the prayer and then after the prayer we'll do a little more. So carrying on then to the next hadith which is al-hadith as-sadis fi ithbat al-kalam wa as-sawt the sixth hadith is an affirmation of the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the 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 sound or the voice that Allah speaks and it is heard Allah speaks and it is heard. So the hadith mentioned is the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. يَقُولُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى يَا آدَمُ فَيَقُولُ لَبَّيْكَ وَسَعْدَيْكَ فَيُنَادِي بِسَوْتِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُكَ أَنْ تُخْرِجَ مِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِكَ بَعْفًا إِلَى النَّارِ Al-Hadith, muttafaqun alayh. <coughs> In this hadith it mentions, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us, narrating from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, on yawm al-qiyamah, Allah will call out to Adam alayhi salam. Ya Adam. Ya Adam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will call out to Adam. And Adam will reply and say, Labbaik wa sa'adaik. Labbaik bima'na ijabatan ba'da ijaba. That I respond to your call i am here in response to your call wa sa'adayka is'adan ba'da is'ad meaning aid me and assist me in fulfilling your call i am here present in your obedience to answer your call That is basically the meaning of labbaik. I am here in obedience to you to answer your call. That is what the hujjaj they say, labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. That oh Allah, I am here in obedience to you, in submission to you to answer your call. So then it mentions in the hadith, فَيُنَادِي بِسَوْتِ So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls out with a voice. And that is in reference to Allah. فَيُنَادِي يعني Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala يُنَادِي بِسَوْتِ And the fact that the hadith says that Allah will then call out with a voice. When you call out, then that is obviously with a voice that is heard that is the nature of calling out it is with a voice but the fact (coughs) that it has been mentioned specifically that it is besought is an emphasis upon the affirmation of this attribute of speech to allah it is like in the Quran, وَلَا طَائِرٍ يَطِيرُ بِجِنَاحَيْهِ 
that there is not a bird that flies with its two wings. وَلَا طَائِرٍ يَطِيرُ بِجَنَاحَيْهِ Of course we know there is no other way that a bird flies except with its two wings. So here the mentioning of the two wings, that a bird flies with its two wings, the mentioning of the two wings is for the purpose of emphasis. Even without that being mentioned, we know how a bird flies. It is with the two wings, of course. But the fact that the ayah mentions it, the bird flies with its two wings, is an emphasis. So here, that Allah calls out with a voice is simply emphasis. Otherwise, calling out, we know, is with a raised voice. So then Allah calls out and says, Inna Allah ya'muruka an tukhrija min dhurriyyatika ba'afan ila nar That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands you to extract from your progeny an amount to the fire. And notice how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the command in the third person. Allah is the one talking and Allah says, Inna Allah ya'muruka. And Allah didn't say, Inni amuruka. Rather in the third person, Allah speaking about himself in the third person. Indeed Allah commands you. And that is as a means of indicating and demonstrating the greatness and the might and the majesty of Allah. When a person in this world now, in the language, when a person speaks about himself in the third person, it is to indicate his status and magnificence. Like the king says to his people, The king orders you to go out and do such and such. He is the king. Why not just say, I order you to go such and such. But he may say, the king orders you to go in third person. Even though he is the king. Because in that phrase, there is an element of demonstrating your greatness. The king commands you to do X, Y, and Z. And he is the king himself. So this is from that type of perspective when Allah says, Inna Allah ya'muruka, rather than saying, Inni amuruka. Instead of saying, I command you, Allah says, Indeed, Allah commands you to, mag- to show the magnificence and greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is in other parts of the Quran as well. So Allah then says uh, or commands and to min dhurriyatika ba'fan ila nar that you extract from your ummah a, a, an amount to the fire wal hadith na'am al akhar in the full narration of the other narration or the other hadith in al bukhari and muslim it clarifies all of that in the hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, قَالْ وَمَا بَعْثُ النَّارِ And what is this delegation or amount of the fire? قَالَ مِنْ كُلِّ أَلْفٍ تِسْعُمِئَةٍ وَتِسْعَ وَتِسْعُونَ From every thousand, 999 from every thousand 999 فذلك حين يشيب الصغير وتضع كل ذات حمل حملها وترى الناس سكارى وما هم بسكارى ولكن عذاب الله شديد and that is then it's quoted here then That is when the young ones will turn white. 
their hairs will turn white, those who are young, where it is not expected yet for the blackness of the hair to turn white, but they will turn white and they will turn grey, even though they are young. And those who are carrying their uh, 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 in pregnancy, they will drop that. And though people, the people, you will see them as though they are intoxicated, but in reality they are not. But it is all because of the severity of the punishment of Allah. فَاشْتَدَّ ذَلِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ فَقَالُوا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أَيْنَا ذَلِكَ الرَّجُلِ أينا ذلك الرجل؟ قال أبشروا فإن من يأجوج ومأجوج تسعمائة وتسعة وتسعون ومنكم واحد أنتم في الأرض كالشعرة السوداء في جنب الثور الأبيض أو كشعرة البيضاء في جنب الثور الأسود إني لأرجو أن تكونوا ربع أهل الجنة فكبرنا ثم قال ثلث أهل الجنة فكبرنا ثم قال شطر أهل الجنة فكبرنا وروى هذا المعنى جماعة من الصحابة <coughs> So when this, when this narration was mentioned that out of every thousand out of every thousand 999 are taken to the hellfire out of every thousand 999 to the fire so then they said which one of us will be the saved one, ayyuna thalika rajul But then the messenger said to them, glad tidings to you, for indeed, ya'juj and ma'juj, they will be as like 999, and from amongst you just one, and you will be like a black hair on the side of a white uh, bull, or like a white hair on the side of a black bu- uh, a bull. And I hope that a quarter of you will be from the people of paradise. And so it says that they said, Allahu Akbar. So then the messenger said, a third of you from the people of paradise. And they did the takbir again. And he said, a half of you from the people of paradise. The point of this is, here for our purposes, that in the hadith is an affirmation of the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again. We already covered that previously from the ayat of the Qur'an. Now we're looking at the ahadith of the sunnah. So in this hadith on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, Allah speaks, calls out to Adam alayhi salam, and that command from Allah is heard by Adam alayhi salam, so that is an affirmation of the speech of Allah. Similarly, Qawluhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ma minkum min ahadin illa sayukallimuhu rabbuhu wa laysa baynahu wa baynahu tarjuman. The statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that there is not any one of you Except that Allah will speak to you on the day of judgment. And there will be no interpreter between you and Allah. There is not one of you except that Allah will speak to you on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And there will not be any interpreter between you and Allah. So this is again very clear in regards to the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِلَّا سَيُكَلِّمُهُ رَبُّهُ Except that his Lord will speak to him. يَعْنِي هَذِهِ حَالُهُ سَيُكَلِّمُهُ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ لَيْسَ بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَهُ تَرْجُمَانِ وَذَلِكَ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ So this is what will be the state that Allah will speak to everyone and there will be no other intermediary in between. There will be no other interpreter in between. هو الذي يكون الترجمان هو الذي يكون واسطة بين متكلمين مختلفين في اللغة أو متكلمين مختلفين في اللغة ينقل إلى أحدهما كلام الآخر باللغة التي يفهمها. The interpreter is 
an intermediary between two people who speak different languages. So he narrates what one of them says to the other in the language that they understand. He translates, interprets. And as a side benefit, the Shaykh mentions here, as a side point, يُشْتَرَطُ فِي الْمُتَرْجِمْ أَرْبَعَةْ شُرُوطِ that any translator must have four conditions. For anybody to translate, there have to be four conditions in place. And all of the scholars, many of the scholars have mentioned the same thing. The four of those are firstly, al amana That it must be somebody trustworthy. An individual who is honest, dignified, trustworthy individual. Secondly, an yakuna and an al amana being trustworthy, then really that revolves around diana, that it is a person who is practicing righteous, a person of taqwa, that is the kind of person who has amana, that is the kind of person who has trustworthiness and honesty in his affairs. Second condition, an <coughs> yakuna aliman. باللغة التي يترجم منها That you must be an alim, knowledgeable, with detailed knowledge of the language that you are translating from. You must understand that language fully and properly. So if you're translating from Arabic to English, then you must have an in-depth knowledge and understanding of the Arabic language. And no doubt that comes through recognition and understanding, detailed understanding of the grammar of the Arabic language. Without a detailed understanding of the grammar of the Arabic language, you will never be able to translate accurately. Knowing the meanings of words is one thing. Anybody can have mawrid next to them and find the meanings of the words. But the reality of understanding what is being said and what is being intended in this phrase, that only comes with a deep recognition of the grammar of Arabic. How the word has been put, where it has been put, why it's mansub, why it's majroor, all of that massively impacts the meaning of the language. So the second condition is to have a detailed knowledge of the Arabic language or, or whichever language you're translating from. The third condition, إِلَيْهَا To have a detailed knowledge of the language that you are translating into. So if it's Arabic to English, to have a detailed knowledge of the English language. And this... These two points are the main or, or from amongst the main problems or issues that are recognized and noticed in translations. That either the translator has made errors due to his lack of knowledge of Arabic, for example, or there are errors due to his lack of knowledge of English, for example. That he is unable to punctuate accurately Unable to put the, the commas in the right place and without the comma in the right place, for example. Something small like that. You could change the understanding of a sentence depending on how it's being read then. Without putting the semicolon in the right place, without putting the hyphen in the right place. All of those things. You have to have a detailed knowledge of English too. If it's Arabic to English that is being done. So both language, the source language and the target language. You must have good understanding of both of those to be able to translate. Sometimes a person may be very strong in one of the two languages, may be an expert in one of the two languages, but that's never going to be enough to make a good translation. If you're weak in one and an expert in the other, then it's not enough. It's a mismatch and a misbalance. It requires a in-depth an in-depth level of knowledge of both the target and source language to have the condition fulfilled to be able to translate. 
And also the fourth condition, maybe somebody is trustworthy, maybe somebody is an expert in Arabic, for example, here, and English, for example, here. But then the fourth condition, an yakuna bil bil mawdu'i alladhi yutarjimuhu. An yakuna aliman bil mawdu'i alladhi yutarjimuhu. <coughs> that the person must be knowledgeable of the subject that he is translating. You must have an in-depth knowledge of the subject you are translating. So you could have somebody with amana, trustworthy, expert in the source language, expert in the target language, but he's never studied aqidah properly. He's never studied any books of the uh, Aqidah, al wasatiyah Kitab al tawheed any of the books, he's never studied them. So now even if he has all the other conditions, he may now start looking into these books, trying to translate them, and he makes mistakes, not because he's weak in the Arabic language, or because he's weak in the English language, but because he simply doesn't understand the content. Not the language, he understands the language. But he doesn't understand the content. What is the meaning of this aqidah when we say this and when we say that? And what do the scholars mean by this phrase and that phrase? So you must have an in-depth knowledge of the subject. For example, now there are topics that are complicated, no doubt. A person could be an expert in both languages and have the amana. But if he's never studied a particular field with the scholars, doesn't have a recognition of the terminology in that field, doesn't understand what the scholars mean when they use certain phrases, then that person is going to end up translating accurately as he believes, because he's an expert in the two languages, but there are going to be mistakes in his understanding, because he doesn't recognize what these phrases mean, and what they are intending. It's like when it's mentioned in Kitab al-Tawheed, when it's mentioned about the Tama'im, and it says, Ibrahim and Nakha'i kanu yakrahuna tama'ima kullaha. What does it mean? Kareha <coughs> yakrahu, typically the translation of that in English is to hate something, to detest something. But now, if you translate that as they used to hate all of the tama'im, that's very different to saying that they used to view all of tama'im as haram, which is the actual meaning here. Because when the salaf say, yakrahuna such and such, then the reality of that is, yuharrimuna such and such. And even other basic things like, ya'buduna, wa ma khalaqtu jinna wa nisa illa liya'budun. A person has expert knowledge in the languages, he says, khalas. It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, I did not create man and jinn, except for them to worship me. And leave it at that without any explanation, without anything else, when teaching that or translating that. And the reality of Ya'buduna in these verses is Yuwahidun, worshipping Allah upon Tawheed. Not worshipping Allah with association of partners or anything else. Just examples where you may be fluent in your understanding of the languages, but it requires an in depth understanding of the subject field. And that subject matter. Now a person who is fluent in Arabic and English, but has never studied Islamic sciences, they would not be able to translate Al-Wasatiyya or Al-Tahawiyya or Usul Al-Fiqh or the Mustalahat of Al-Hadith. You would not be able to translate those subject fields because they are fields with specific terminology, with specific intent behind the words and the meanings. And that's why probably... In fact, not probably. That is why in reality, you see, for example, a Sheikh Al-Fawzan, he does not give permission for anyone to translate his works. You know this. A Sheikh Al-Fawzan does not give permission for anyone to translate his works until it has gone through his office. Until it has gone through his office, he does not endorse any translations from him. He has said this, it is on record. So you could translate now a book of a Sheikh Al-Fawzan and it could be perfect. But it is not endorsed by the Sheikh. Until it goes through his office, 
He gives it to his people, they check it, they verify, they precisely go through it all. And once they give it the green tick, now it is endorsed and verified. For these reasons, the Shaykh is well aware of these reasons. You may now, a person may come along who, ha who doesn't have these conditions in place. He's not strong in the languages or he's not strong in those subject fields. He's never studied with the scholars. He may now translate the book of a Shaykh al-Fawzan with mistakes in it, with tahrif in some of the words and statements. And now it's being spread to the people as a Shaykh al-Allama al-Fawzan said X, Y and Z. And he never said anything of the sort. But it is being attributed to him now because of the weakness of this narrator. And so he on record has said, I do not endorse the translations that people make until they go through us, until they go through my office. And you can do that. You can apply. And brothers have done that in the past. People have done that in the past. You can do your translation, submit it to the office of the sheikh. And then his uh, qualified people will look at that. And then they will either endorse it or they will say, no, this translation is not good enough. It does not pass. And I'm aware of people who have got the permission and also people who have been told, throw this away. It is not suitable, it is not good enough for a translation. So the point here is, for translating, it is not something simple. Sometimes you have people, they learn a little bit of Arabic and now want to translate benefits, and want to translate this and translate that. But you should calm the matter and look carefully and slowly into the matter. It is not simple. A person who has never done even to the level of Ajrumiya perhaps, how are you going to translate accurately? You do not even know Medina Book 3, the grammar from there. Somebody picks up Medina Book 3 and asks you the grammar you do not know. How are you translating accurately? If you do not even know what the hal is, what the maf'ul mutlaq is, what this is, what that is. How are you translating these words into English then? It's one thing translating Maurid English. That's as good as Google Translate. It's another thing knowing the details of the affair and the grammar and then understanding how to translate a particular thing. So these are important points the Shaykh highlights as a side benefit. The point of our section here though was وَمَا مَا مِنْكُمْ مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا سَيُكَلِّمُهُ رَبُّهُ That there is none from amongst you except that his Lord will speak to him. So that is an affirmation of the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.